Ecclesiastes chapter uh, 3 and uh, verse number now, verse number uh, 8, verse number 8, chapter th- Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse number 8. Now, I'm going to tell you, you'll, you don't see me preach out of the book of Ecclesiastes too often. It is the Word of God, no question about it. But Ecclesiastes is a misused book by, by the world. The world quotes out of Ecclesiastes more than any book there is. And the reason they do is because Ecclesiastes is a view of life from a human perspective. And God lets you see that, and he puts it in the Bible. God puts a lot of things in the Bible, and, uh, but he allows us to even see how we see things. And if you'll notice a phrase in the book of Ecclesiastes, it says, under the sun, under the sun, under the sun. And what it's saying is that if you don't see beyond the sun, if you don't see beyond the horizon, you can see you'll never see life as it really is. And the, the ultimate deal of the whole thing is vanity and vexation of spirit. In other words, if you don't see life and have a life that's beyond this world, it's vanity and vexation of spirit. But there's some great passages of Scripture in the book of Ecclesiastes. And this morning I just want to hit something and preach this very quickly. But I tell you, in all my, with, with all of my heart, my heart is in the message. I want to try to preach very quickly, and it's not, I'm, not, I'm not going to preach nothing today that you don't already know. I'm not going to say a thing that you don't really already know in your spirit and your heart. I'm just going to simply be a vessel today and a tool. Maybe God will remind you of some precious things. I'm so glad for the resurrection day. By the way, this is not Easter. I know. Don't, I'm not off on a trip, okay? Don't worry about it. Easter really, Easter really is a pagan Roman holiday. And uh, it's mentioned in the Bible as a specific time period, as, as a place in that culture. It's in the book of Acts mentioned. And Easter fell uh, 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 close to the time of Christ's resurrection. Easter was incorporated into the Roman Catholic Church uh, back in probably around 300 A.D. in that time period. It was incorporated into their whole deal. And uh, as they welded together, as they tried to weld together paganism and Christianity... But uh, Christians, honestly, in the goodness, this is the resurrection for us. This is the resurrection. And that's what we're celebrating today. But I don't get off on a, you know, the resurrection doesn't have anything to do with Easter bunnies and stuff. You know, I got tickled. We were reading Christmas. We were reading Christmas in Luke chapter 6, you know, and Easter Sunday. I thought, this is just like this church. Amen. That's all right. And, uh, but it, it's okay. But uh, just, and I'm not off on a trip, and you know what, if you want to go have, hunt Easter eggs, help yourself, have a good time. But make sure you teach your kids that that's not what this is really about. Make sure they know this about Christ. That he died for our sins and rose from the dead on the third day. That, he, that they know that that's what it's about. Okay? All right. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse number 8. The first little line. That's all we're going to read. A time to love. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this day. I, I'm so aware, God, of your presence, and I'm so aware, God, of your orchestration of this service. Lord, there's no telling how many times I've messed up what you wanted to do. Uh, Lord, I pray today that I won't. I pray, God, today that we'll just surrender everything to you right now. And Holy Spirit of God, I let, I'd walk away from the pulpit, Lord, right now, rather than get in the way of what you want to do in our lives today. But God, I pray that You'll help us to preach this message you've given us today on this day of the greatest evidence of love that there ever was. When you so loved this world that you gave your son to die on that cross for our sins and rose from the dead. Lord, what an act of love to redeem us from all hell. To redeem us from our sins. To forgive us. To make a way of reconciliation. To be justified, redeemed, reconciled, regenerated, born again, saved. God delivered from the power of darkness, given a home in heaven, given eternal life. God, what love. Lord, you loved us while we were yet sinners. God, I tell you, I don't have it within my finite ability to comprehend that kind of love. Lord, the things that I've done since I've been saved, Lord, that are shameful and sinful. God, I'd have a hard time forgiving others. And yet, Lord, you've always been there to forgive. Your mercy has been from everlasting to everlasting. Your love has been from everlasting. Your mercy has been new every morning. And God, the older I grow and the closer I grow to you and the more I see my own wicked wretchedness, Lord, I realize how much you love us. And God, I don't understand everything, but I do know, Lord, that you've given us this life. 
And that, Lord, it is a time to love. And I pray, God, that you'd help me to preach this simple little message you've given me today. And help us to be a people who realize every day is the time to love. In Jesus' name, amen. As I said, if you'll turn over a few pages to Song of Solomon, chapter 8. Song of Solomon, just a few pages to your right. And in verse number 7, the Bible says there in chapter 8, verse number 7, Many waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods drown it. If a man would give all the substance of his house for love, it would utterly be condemned. God says there that many waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods drown it. I, I, I really believe that in our generation we've lost the whole idea of what love is. Take your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. God doesn't leave you wondering what love is. God tells us very clearly and very distinctively what love is. And God says in Ecclesiastes 3, 8 there that there is a time to love. There's a time to love. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and um, beginning at verse 1, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not charity, I'm nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profits me nothing. I'm not going to preach on all that, but it'll do you good to meditate in that right there and realize that love, charity, God's love is not a lot of what the world thinks it is. Now, he really begins to define, and the first real specific definition of love here, he says, charity suffereth long. Now, charity is love and action. You've got the word love, and then you have the word charity. Charity is love and action. And let me tell you how God, love is not just some little emotional feeling. For God so loved the world that he gave. God moved into action. And genuine biblical love always moves us into action. The Bible talks about this. You, somebody has a need, and you say, oh, God bless you, and I'll be praying for you. But you have it within your power to help, and you don't. You don't tell that person you love them because you don't. Love really and honestly moves itself into action. I've always said this. You can tell to the degree how much you love people by how fast you forgive them. People that you love a lot, you forgive very quickly. If you find yourself having trouble uh, forgiving someone or having a resentful feeling towards someone, I guarantee you, you don't love them as much as you should. Because they're, the people that you love very closely, that you love very deeply, you'll find yourself, you forgive them real quick. Uh, just check with your kids. Your kids do something, you know. I mean, you may whoop them, but you forgive them. Amen? And, but somebody else's kids does it. Sorry, low-down rascals. Looks like they straighten them up, you know. He said love suffereth long. There's a time to love. God says love suffereth long. The first definition God gives of love is suffers long. It puts up with people. 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 Every week of my life now, I'm talking not some weeks, I'm talking every week of my life, I'm dealing with people out here in work who are getting divorced. Every week of my life. You know why they don't love each other? I'm telling you something. Now listen to me. I'm not saying that one party may be more innocent or some party's innocent. I'm just telling you somewhere somebody's not loving. Somewhere somebody's not loving. Or they would suffer along with each other. I mean, why in the world do we say such things as for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, until death do us part? Why do we say that? We have a biblical base underneath our country. And, 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 and we understand this thing that love requires suffering. And it requires long suffering. It takes a lot of putting up with people. Then it says the next thing about love is kind. That's the second thing God says about love is kind. Now the next thing it says it envieth not. Love doesn't want what other people have. And it doesn't have a devious feeling if other people have things that I don't. Charity vaunteth not itself. It does, it's not proud. It isn't trying to exalt itself and puff itself up, but it says not puffed up. And then it doth not behave itself unseemly. It doesn't do a lot of stupid things. And it seeketh not her own. You ought to underline that. Love does not seek her own. Is not easily provoked. Whew. Not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things. Believeth all things. Hopeth all things. Endureth all things. Charity never faileth. <clears throat> now, God describes what genuine love is in that passage of Scripture. As I said in John three sixteen, the greatest projection of real love is God so loved this world. If you're here today and you're lost, I want you to know something. This is not just a little cliche. For God so loved the world that He did give His only begotten Son. 
that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God does not want you to go to hell. And he's loved you so much that he gave his son. And the only way you can be saved is receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior to be born again. But as depraved as we are and as sorry and as fleshly, and what amazes me is that as sorry as I am, God has given us the gift and the capacity to love one another and to love him. Did that ever hit you? I mean, as wicked and wretched and sorry and worthless as I am, yet God not only loved me and gave his son for me, but he gives me the capacity and the gift to love him back and to love other people. I don't tell you something, that's a gift and that's a blessing, and we don't want to throw it aside in life. We're told in the Bible to love God. We're told in the Bible to love our neighbor. We're told in the Bible to love our enemies. We're told in the Bible to love one another. And we're told in the Bible to love our wives. And we're told in the Bible to love for wives to love their husbands. Some verses in the Bible. Jesus said this, by, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples, that you love one another. He said there's a guaranteed, positive proof, acid test that people can know you're a Christian if you love each other. The Bible said we know that we've passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Acid test. Love is the acid test. He, Jesus said if you love me, keep my commandments. Ye that love the Lord hate evil. Love rejoices in the truth. He that loveth his son correcteth him. God's very clear that any father that loves his child will correct that child, will chase that child, will make that child mine, will teach that child and train that child. God says that love covereth all sins. Proverbs 15 verse 17 says that better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a stalled ox and hatred therewith. God's saying it's better to have a little bit of crackers and bread in your house and love in your house than steaks and Everything else and hatred and strife and contention in that house. Galatians chapter 5 tells us something very precious. That love is a fruit of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. And we know that God is love and love comes from God. And you cannot get love any place in this world except from God, the Holy Spirit. First John tells us that love is of God and God is love. The Bible tells us further than this. that the, Hey, say, Reggie, how do we get it? The Bible said the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. Folks, we just don't jive up love. That's why people are, that's why I say we need a, a redefining of, of love and a re, getting back to a biblical understanding of love because the devil and the world will always give you a false idea of what genuine love is. Now, I want to say something to you here this morning. Listen, this is simple, not, not, but maybe it's profound, but it's sure simple. It's not intellectual. Sin is a killer and a chiller of love. Now, I want to tell you something. If you're living in secret sin, if you have secret sin in your life, I promise you, you're having difficulty demonstrating love toward God and other people. Because sin kills love. Sin is the opposite of love. I mean, it is the destroyer of love. It, it's, it's the ravager of love. And secret sin in your life, and I'm talking to Christian people right now, I'm going to tell you something. If I let some secret sin kind of bite in my heart and I tinker around with it and I don't let God the Holy Ghost deal with it, it chills my love for God, for the Word of God, for the people of God, the house of God, anything God that chills it. And I'm telling you something, you mess with it, it'll kill out that love in your heart. The Bible said, in the latter days, the love of many shall wax cold. We're seeing that. Let me tell you something, folks. We are living in the latter days. We are living in the last days. The Bible said, love worketh ill, worketh no ill toward his neighbor. The Bible said, finally, the greatest of these, it talks about all these wonderful things you can have, but the greatest of these is what? Love. The greatest of these is charity. My text was this, and I'll do this quickly. It said there's a time for love. I'm going to tell you something. What is your life? It's even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. And so you have this time in your life. First of all, I want to say there's a time. It, it is a time now to love your church family. To love your church family. I want you to look around you today. And I mean that literally. I'd like you folks over there to take a good look at those folks over to, across you. It would do you good to sweep your eyes across this congregation. Not in just seeing who's here. But seeing real people whom God has brought into fellowship in this church. Let me tell you something. If there's anything God has done to me over the years, let me tell you, I'm keenly aware. I'm telling you something. It, it's not an accident. It's not just a little thing. If God brings people together in a fellowship of believers, you better pay real close attention to the people that God's bringing into your life. 
You may not like their personality. Let me tell you something. I, I, I don't expect people to like my personality. I'm honest with you. I, Don, where you at when I need you, man? Come on. <laughs> He's got his mouth zipped up back here. Somebody's put super glue on down. Let me tell you something. Let, let's just be real. Don Zen can be real kind of a... He can be abrasive. Thank you. He can be obnoxious. <laughs> okay. But you know what? Don Zent, Don, that was a great Sunday school class. We do love you. Believe it or not, we honestly do love you. But I'm going to tell you something. Are you listening? I'm trying to get a point across to you. I can be abrasive. I can be uh, very unthoughtful. I can be uh, very uh, just inconsiderate. I mean, I just kind of live in my world, and you, your expectations of me can be. But I'm going to tell you whether you understand it or not, we're all wicked, we're all lost, we're all sinners, but yet God brings us together. And I'm telling you something, there's a time. You better love these people that God has brought in here together because God's going to do special things in your life over a period of time. And this church is a laboratory of love, I promise you. And it's going to be where God teaches you how to suffer long. And it's going to be where God teaches you how to be kind. And it's going to be where God teaches you to endure all things. And the church is a laboratory of love. And I'm telling you, learn to appreciate the people you go to church with. Let me tell you something. What if it was just you here this morning? Just you, all by yourself, drove up in one car in that parking lot. One person walking up there. Did you know the person that you probably liked the least in here, you'd be tickled to see next Sunday? Uh-huh. <laughs> Amen. Let me tell you something. This world's had enough of this critical spirit in churches. This world's had enough of this here you know, this here condemning critical, acoustic, you know, bunch of junk, you know, well, I, you know, like I barely can put up with you and I won't want to sit within five seats of you and I don't want to look at you and I don't want to shake your hands and I can't stand you and I don't know why you don't make your kids mine. And I, all these attitudes. I'll tell you something, we need to love each other. To pray. I didn't say you had to like the way everybody acts. I'm not asking you to like the way I act about everything. But I'll tell you what, you got to love me. And i got to love you. And it's time to do that. Look around you. Let me tell you something, you look around you real good, because everybody sitting here won't always be here. If you're sitting there saying, bless God, I'm not going to outlast them. That's why I'm staying here. I'm going out. <laughs> there's, there's a prayer bench, and you need it. Amen. <laughs> They won't always be here. There's hardly a Sunday of my life that I get up and preach and I can't see Brother Smith's face or Brother Lovelace's face. They won't always be here. I've had the privilege of pastoring some of the greatest men in this country. My father-in-law's face is not out there today. But I can see him smiling in the pew in my mind. Sister Loveless. Man, I used to, it thrilled my heart to see them wheeling her in here every Sunday morning. I remember her getting up and singing. Somebody help me out a song she always sung. Oh, I can't believe I can't take off on it. Do, 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 do. What if it were today? Boy, I mean, tell you what, man. I mean, that was Miss Loveless. Amen. And then one day it came that day, <laughs> and she went home to see the Lord. But I think about old brother Loveless. I think about him going to house to house in Mountain Grove, passing out tracts and inviting folks to church. Nobody even asking him to do it. He just did it because he wanted to do it but for Jesus' sake, and he loved the church. I'm telling you something. I, they won't always be here. I, I remember that night that we had down at Brother Lakey's, that campfire. How many of you guys remember that campfire? I'll tell you, that's special, wasn't it? Boy, I'm going to tell you something, guys. You know something? They won't always be with us, and you better appreciate it. You know, I appreciate it, Brother Harold. I tell you what, he had a love for God, and he had a love for the Word of God. And I tell you something, he did a pretty nice job of raising the kid back there, whether you think so or not. I like that boy back there. Amen. What I'm saying this to you, I appreciate the people. They won't always be here. And I think about not only that, but I think about Brother Jack Craddleville, and I'm not trying to make anybody cry this morning, but I'm going to tell you something. They won't always be here. And you better love them while they're here. You better love the people you're sitting next to and the people that you're worshiping with. You know, I'm just telling you, Frankie, me and you're not always going to be here. Donnie, me and you're not always going to be here. I'm telling you, listen, Brother Ralph, me and you won't always be here. And you better love these people. These are the people God has ordained and chosen for you to fellowship with. 
love to love each other. In my land, I couldn't help but mention Brother and Sister Williams. When I was preaching up there on that end, Brother Williams, had always, he, he, he had a, I think he had a hip problem or leg problem, and he would sit down on the outside and stick his leg out in the aisle. Amen? And then he was ready for church. <laughs> but can't you see Sister Williams smile back there? She ought to be sitting right back there just, just grinning like I mean all heaven. Amen? Just How many know she had the glow of glory on her face? What a privilege it was to go to church with her. And I'm going to tell you something. There's some of you do not realize who you're going to church with right now. And the Holy Ghost someday will pull back the shade on your eyes and you'll realize what you had and the treasure you had. But the, I'm going to tell you the sad sin of it is, is that we're going to church with people and we don't even love them like we ought to. Others have moved and I miss them. I, there's somebody I miss so bad. Brother Jack Klein. How many misses old Jack Klein? Man, I'm telling you what, that guy, he just blessed my heart. I never will forget the night he got saved. He got saved in his house. I'd, I'd preached to him for about three years here at this church, you know. He just sat back there just, you know, good man and all that, but not saved. And one night he called me, and I was in bed. It must have been midnight. And I got, he said, Reggie, this is Jack. I just got saved by my bedside up here at my house. And I was like, go away, man. And that guy went to work for God, worked here in the school. I mean, sacrifice. And I miss him. And I think he's backslid. I think he'll move back. Amen. <laughs> no. But this is your spiritual team right here. You know, the 3rd of July deal is coming up, and we do all these CDs. We do all this work and everything. You know, and I'm going to tell you something. This ain't no one-man team. Amen. It takes a lot of people to do what we're doing here. But it's a wonderful. This is your spiritual team. Don't fight your own team. Don't fight your own spiritual family. Suffer long with each other, endure each other, be kind to each other, forgive each other, be merciful to each other, uh, greet one another. Amen. I, I, that's, this time of greeting is important. It's important. See, see, you know, and, and try to get away from that little clique that you live in. Amen. You know, if you guys ain't careful, we, you know, we got our little Kelly clique over here, and you got your little clique, your little Williams clique, and you got your little Phil clique, and you know, if you ain't careful, hey, you know, bust out and go see somebody else out. There's people out there that need your handshake, that need your smile, that need your love. I'm just saying this, stand by your, each other. You know what, we ought to never allow somebody to talk bad about each other out in the public. You know that? I mean, if somebody says to you, I can't stand your preacher, he's a sorry lowdown. You say, you know, that's, you, you don't know how bad Reg Kelly is. I go to church there. <laughs> but he's my brother in Christ. And I love him, so shut your mouth. You know, when somebody talks about you, I'll tell you what, and I've had it happen. I've told, I've, you, you think it takes, it don't take me a New York minute to shut somebody off. I've had some people say some things to me about people go here. You know what? I'm not going to stand by and let somebody run down somebody who's been faithful and prayed for me and loved me whenever I was down the ditch. Let me tell you something. We're all just, we're all just hellish, ought to have been in hell sinners anyway. There ain't no good in us apart from Christ. Righteousness is the only righteousness that we have. And you know what? Oh, Abraham Lincoln said it. He said, if I ever find a church where they love one another, I'll join it. Never did join one. I wonder, could it be said because of you? Could they say about this church, they love one another up there, if everybody watched you? Let me tell you something. People are looking for a church that loves one another. And God said a time to love. And I'm telling you something, brother. I want to tell you how you can show your love to this church. Number one, you pray for each other. Number two, you live for God out there. You live for God out there. You see, the average fundamental preacher get up here and tell you that, let's God be here three Sundays a week and that, and that'll show you love the church. Well, you know what? You show your church by being here, but you show you love the church and you love your other members by living for God when you leave here. More so than by being here. Now, I'm not negating being here, and some of you need to be here when you ain't here. But I'm going to tell you something. Now, you know this. I ain't one of these preachers that are going to go banging on your door. Where would you get last Sunday? If you ain't got enough love of God in your heart to get you at this church, you think I'm going to babysit you from here to glory? You lost your mind. Now, I care about you, and I mean that. But I found out a long time ago, it's, you're, it's a ban it's spirit of ban it's just wasted time. If somebody ain't got it in their heart, the Holy Ghost don't put it in them, you ain't going to put it in them. And besides that, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. I don't come to church because my mom and dad sitting back there and they'd wonder where I was at if I wasn't here. <laughs> you think I've been preaching here 28 years because my dad's sitting there? Where was Reggie at? Huh? 
No. And I'm going to tell you something. If you're coming to this church because you want your mom and dad want us where you're at, you're coming for the wrong reasons. When are you going to grow up and come to church because you love Jesus Christ? The time to love. Amen. Time to love the church. I tell you, I love this church, and there's something special. You know, the, the best thing God ever did to me, besides preaching about salvation, one of the things, is preaching on people having kids. And I'll tell you something, I, I'll tell you something I got at my house I wouldn't take a farm in Texas for. I got two or three boxes of love notes. I've got them, amen. And they're the most precious thing. I'll tell you what, some days when it all has washed out, all I got to do is just reach down there and start going through them little old notes at these little rats. Them little rascals wiggling their eyes. I didn't think they'd pay no attention. They'd draw me out just like that. Amen. <laughs> the sweetest little thing you ever do is have one of them come and say, Here, Pastor, and you open up and say, He said, That's you. I said, Oh, that's me. Okay. <laughs> you know, I love you. I've got some notes up there. I, <laughs> this is funny. Little kids wrote down and said, You're the best preacher I've ever heard. They ain't heard no other preacher, but they think I'm the best preacher they've ever heard. Amen? They ain't never been nowhere else. But you know what? I'm telling you something, folks. Love. Love. I'll tell you what. We've got to love each other. It's a time to love. I'm begging you in Jesus' name. This is Easter Sunday. We want to call it. This is Resurrection Sunday. Let's renew our love one to another in this church. You know what? You make up your mind that every soul walks through that door, you're going to love them for Jesus' sake. Irregardless of how bad their breath stinks. Irregardless of how stupid things they say and the way they act and the things they've done and the five dollars they owe you. It wasn't five dollars, how about five hundred? God help us to be gone. You know what you ought to say in your heart right now? I'm done being critical about people. I'm, you know, Philip, you'd probably be surprised how many people looks at your back at back of the head of your ears and checks your ears, see if they're are your kids' ears clean. I'll tell you what, my, you know what my mama used to do on the way to church? She, she could twist around in the seat, grab boys, pull them up, and it had, she had a black and decker deal. <laughs> my, mama's, my mama had a handkerchief, and she'd go, how many's ever been cleaned out with a spit-on handkerchief? You're just cleaned out. <laughs> I don't know how that gets them clean, but it's supposed to, Amen. <laughs> Oh, Mom, don't you sit back here and shake your head. You did that. <laughs> your sins will find you out. <laughs> Mom says she didn't have to tell him. <laughs> but, you know, if you ain't careful, you're just watching what other folks are doing. Looking for something you can pick on. Looking for something you can see negative about them. I, I don't know why. To be honest with you, Kenny, you've been on my heart just every day. Pray for Kenny. Pray for Kenny. Elliot, you say you shouldn't say things like that in church. This is my family. These are my brothers in Christ. And I just ain't got enough time to look at the bad side. There's not enough time to look at the, well, I don't like this about so-and-so, and and I don't like this about so-and-so. You know what? You know why Christianity is dying in America? is because we're not loving. And people can spot it. And it's like God said to me, Reggie, you ain't got time to think negatively about people. You ain't got time. It's the time to love people. The time to love your church families now. Let me go quickly. A time to love your parents. Now, you listen to me. I don't care whether you're 50 or whether you're 70 and your mom and daddy's still living or whether you're two. You need to love your parents. It's a time to love them. Love your grandparents. Love them now. You say, Reggie, how can I love them? By honoring them. By honoring them. You demonstrate love to your parents by honoring your parents. Kids, I'm telling you something. Please listen to your preacher today. This is the Word of God. Honor thy father and thy mother. Honor thy father and thy mother. Obey your your parents in the Lord. I'm telling you, listen, there's a time to love your mom and dad. Time is now. Some of you sitting here and you don't like the way your mom and dad's doing things. The restrictions you feel they're putting on you. The way they're raising you, whatever. Love your mom and daddy now. 
Let me tell you something. Uh, you, you'll walk in someday and they won't be there. And you don't know when you'll say the last goodbye. Love them by honoring them. Love them by obeying them. But love them by doing things together. By taking time. The thing I'm ashamed of right now, and mom and daddy, I sit up here and I'm condemned while I preach. I'm busy than three cats. And in my spirit, I know that there'll be a day I wish that I went down and seen my mom and dad more often than I do. But I wouldn't take anything for the trips I've taken with them. I'm glad for what we have got to do together. But I tell you, you need to love your mom and daddy. God so designed it. It's a picture of loving your heavenly father. Don't let stupid things chill the love that you owe to your parents. You say, well, you don't know my parents, Reggie. And if you had parents like mine, no, I'm going to tell you something. God does not qualify you loving your mom and dad upon how good they've been or what they have or haven't done. You need to love your mom and daddy. Now it's time to do it. Amen. Let me tell you something. There's been more people than you will ever be able to think about who's walked out on a cemetery and stood by a tombstone and wished they could tell their mom and dad one more time, I love you. Don't be one of those people who swing by the casket and be like that boy in Texas who reached down and grabbed his daddy's body and threw his arms and lifted him almost half out of the casket and said, Daddy, I want to be able to tell you I love you. Don't live your life. Don't get so consumed by what you're doing that you can't take time to love your own mom and daddy. Let me tell you something. I found out, and the truth about it is I know the love of many grow cold and all that, but when it washed, all washed out, let me tell you, I know one thing. If all washed out, let me tell you, the truth about it is today, if my wife left me and my kids left me, do you know I know I could go to my mom and dad and I know they love me? You listen to me. Love your mom and daddy. Now's the time. You say, I, I know that, Reggie. Quit preaching. I, yeah, I'm telling you. I'm just reminding you. Amen. Let's love them. I want to say to my mom and daddy, I love you. Daddy, I love you. Mom, I love you. I'll tell you, that's why I love Christianity, because I know this ain't it. Amen. I'm going to get to be with them for eternity through Jesus Christ. Let me say, thirdly, there's a time to love your children. This week in our family reading, which I don't do very good with, but for Karen, our home wouldn't have any godliness about it, I don't think. But we were reading in Second Samuel chapter 18, and there's the story where Absalom was killed by Joab after he got his hair caught in that thing. And the runners came, two runners, and they told, they told David, he said, he said, how's the boy? And they said, we wish your, all of your enemies to be as he is. And the Bible describes how David turned away and said, oh, my son, my son, Absalom, my son. Would God I had died for thee, oh, Absalom, my son, my son. And God showed me something this week in that past scripture I had never seen before. There David is, weeping and crying. And literally, the love of his soul pouring out his heart. He loved that boy. He loved Absalom. I mean, he loved him. But you know what the problem was? He hadn't loved him like he should have years ago. For had he loved Absalom, he would not have done what he did with Bathsheba. And that whole nonsense came because he wasn't loving his children. Let me tell you something, husband. If you love your children, you won't be lusting after somebody else's wife. And you better think about what's on down the road is going to happen to your children when you follow the trail of that sin and that lust. David loved him, but I'll tell you what, he woke up the fact that he should have loved him. Far, he should have loved him enough to stay away from the sin that got him where it was all at. If David had loved the Lord... David had loved his family. David had loved his children like he should have. He would never have experienced that sword piercing through his soul that day. Love your children enough to do right now so it won't hurt them in the future. Love your children by being faithful to God and faithful to the Bible. Love your children by being faithful to your spouse. Let me tell you one of the greatest ways I can express my love to my children is being faithful to Karen. 
Love your children by being faithful to the church. You say, well, I don't know that I know if that all amounts that much. I'm just going to tell you something. You may not like this, and you may not agree with this, but I can't help it if you're wrong. <laughs> don't blame me. If God has, if God's doing it, just trace this back a little bit. If God's doing anything with this church, if God's done anything with that which he's called me to do, you can trace it back to my mom and dad's faithfulness and love of God, loving God enough and loving me enough to stay faithful to God. Did you know that? Let me tell you something, you mothers and fathers that are sitting here, how do you know what God may want to do with one of your children? You have no earthly idea. I promise you. We pray for God to raise up people in America. I would submit to you that God's probably doing it right underneath your nose. You better love those kids enough to be faithful to God. When you don't feel like getting to church, when you don't feel like reading the Bible, when you don't feel like praying, when you don't feel like going, when you don't feel like it, I'm telling you something, love them enough. Love suffereth long and is kind. Beware of the barrenness of a busy life. Love your children. I read this week something that really jarred me a little bit. And I had not, I spoke to Ronnie Simpson yesterday. I hadn't spoke to him in ages. Ronnie Simpson said something to me. It jarred me. He said, Reggie, when Andy broke his back in that car wreck and couldn't walk no more and hasn't walked since, he said, the only thing I regret is that I hadn't done more with him. And you daddies listen to me. I know you've got to make a living. I know you've got to pay the bills. But you better be doing some things with your kids. You better be doing some things with your kids while you can. You better love them. Let me tell you what your kids will remember. They'll remember the time you took for them. They'll remember the time you took for them. I remember up at Lebanon, Missouri. Let me tell you how fast, why you better love your kids. Mama sent her 16-year-old daughter down to the store to get bread about a mile north of Lebanon for supper. Said, honey, run down and get a loaf of bread. Come out and about a quarter mile down the road, hit a semi and killed that 16-year-old girl. And that mama never got to say hi, I love you, or hug that girl again. I'm telling you something, you better love your kids. It's a time to love. The old poem we had on our house for so long, I, I still love it. Cleaning and scrubbing. Can wait till tomorrow for babies to grow up. We've learned our sorrow. So quiet down, cobwebs and dust go to sleep. I'm rocking my baby, and babies don't keep. They'll move on. Thirdly, or whatever this is, this third, fourth, fifth, sixth, or seventh, who knows? There's a time to love your spouse. There's a time to love your spouse. The Bible's very clear husbands, love your wives. It says further in Scripture, wives, they're to love their husband. I have never seen a time like it is right now when people are throwing their spouses away. Christ loved the church, which is a picture of the husband and the wife, and gave himself for it. I've been married now to Karen 30, what, 32 years? And Have you ever been like me? You wonder sometimes, do I, do I really know how to love them? Do I love my wife? You know, 32 years, Ralph's been about, honey, could you get me this? Honey, could you get me that? It's been about 32 years of fixing me meals and clean sheets and clean house and clean clothes. And, and I'm going to tell you something. Uh, fellas, I don't know about the rest of you, but I'll tell you, I, that woman's been a gift from God. I owe her a debt of love. And I will say flat-footed from this pulpit that I have not loved my wife as much as I wished I had. I, I somehow know there's something in there that wants to love her more than I do. (coughs) 
But if I've ever done you folks any good beyond preaching the gospel, salvation, the word of God, it will be in preaching and praying and pleading for you to keep your marriages together in this church. To love one another, not just to exist and dwell and endure each other, (laughs) which we have to do on occasion, but to have a marriage that literally has the love of God in it, the joy of the Lord in it, the blessings of God, not... You know, I'm not, you know, I'm not enduring being married to her. I'm enjoying being married to Karen. And that's the flat truth. And you can have that with Christ. You really can. You can. And it's a time. There's going to be a time. I'm going to tell you something. One of you is going to bury the other one. Love them today. Love them now. Love them fully. Love them freely. Love them forever. Forgive them. I'll close out and say this. This The Bible said a time to love. It's a time to love our nation. Let me tell you something. You you can send this out. I'm going to do something with this. But I've got $10,000 cash for the man that can prove to me that the federal government has a right to impose health insurance on you in the Constitution. $10,000 $10,000 cash, if you can show me in the Constitution, they've got that power. Now, you listen to me. It's a time to love this nation. To stand, to pray, to fast, to vote, to engage, to get after it with all that's within us. I want to tell you what to save this nation, loving it, loving America. I'm going to be honest with you. Did you know God deals with nation? I, I care about Africa. To be honest, I care about Africa, but did you know something I know? If America don't stay strong, Africa's been there a long time, folk. Been there a long time. There's something special about this country that God ordained it. There's something, that's why the devil's after it so hard. I love Canada. I appreciate Canada and Mexico, but there's something special about this country. And we need to love this nation. And we need to love what this nation has stood for and stand by it. I close out by saying there's a time to love our Lord. When are you going to love God? If you're going to do it, you're going to do it now. The Bible said those that love his appearing, those who look for him. Do you know loving the Savior will keep you from sin better than about anything I know? The time is now. It's your time to love God. We love him, the Bible said, because he first loved us. God loves you and he always will love you. I've said this many times. You may go to hell unsaved, but you'll not go to hell unloved. To the degree that you love God, you'll live for God. Let me tell you something. Now, now I'm, I'm, I'm going to be careful about this because I'm not on, I don't like this condemning, cornering kind of preaching. I like love preaching and liberty preaching. You get people right with God, they'll, they'll do things automatically. But I'm going to be honest with you. If you can be here at services... And you don't come, your problem is love. That's just the truth. That's the fact. If you let yourself drift away and decide, you know what, nah, you know, it don't matter that much to me, what would happen if everybody else did what you're doing? And I'm not condemning, not trying to beat them, because I don't like that, don't go for that, don't have to do that. But I'm being honest with you. I'm going to ask you a question when we close out. I want the pianist to come. It's a time to love. One of the best things I'll ever do for you as a preacher is help you and encourage you to love each other in this church. If you're here today in this church and you've had ought feelings against anybody, your brothers in the Lord and sisters in the Lord, you need to ask God to forgive you. And you need to ask God to replace those feelings that you have with his love. And he will shed abroad the love of God in your heart. I've experienced that. Do people do things I don't like? They act ways I don't like? Yeah. You know what? I don't, let me tell you something. It's helped me a lot. I don't have a right for anybody to come listen to me preach. Sometimes I've wondered why in the why, shock people do. I don't have a right to it. We don't have a right for people to treat us right. We don't have a right for people to be. Did you know you don't have a right for me to make you think you're special? I'm honest with you. Some of you need to yield some of your rights and get some meekness about you and say, you know what? All I've got to do is walk with God. 
Oh, look at his walk with God. Some of you need to love your spouse. It's shocking. I'm telling you something. I could, if, if I could write a book of things that I've seen happen over the years, there would come a point in people's time when they didn't respond to what the Holy Ghost was telling them to do and how it got them later down the road. Satan, Satan, always, Satan always fools you. He's always deceived you. He doesn't tell you what's going to get you by your neglect. I'm telling you this morning, love one another in this church. Appreciate one another. Love your parents. Love your children. Love your spouse. Love your country. Love your God. Every fiber within you. Karen, I want to say to you, honey, I love you. You're the sweetest thing this side of heaven. Amen. Amen. And every husband in this house ought to feel like that. I want to tell my kids I love you. I tell you I love you. I, I, every day goes by, I love my children more and more. And I pray, God, that I love you people. The love I ought to love with you. I want to tell you this morning this. We're going we're gonna to close this out. I want you just to, you know, love is not just some oozy feeling you get. Love is an act of your will. And I'd like you to find somebody this morning and pray right now just real quick that the Holy Ghost would show you someone that you ought to go express some love to. If your mom and daddy's here, it'd be good if you went and told your mom and daddy you love them. If your kids is here, it might be good if you told them, listen, I love you. How many in here notice something? Am I the only guy in this church? I, I'm going to find out something right here. Just hit me. Bill, I'll ask you. Me and you kind of got some of the same sorry ways about us. Do you find it difficult to tell your loved ones you love them? I do too. Daddy, I don't know why. There are times I'm on the phone with you, and I want to say, Daddy, I love you. And I find something trying to block me from saying it. Does anybody else have that trouble? Why in the world, what satanic power would it be that would want to make us not say, I love you? There's something wrong there. And we need to deal with it. So, here's what you do. You go tell somebody you love them today or give them a hug or do something about it. But maybe you want to pray, tell God you love him. Do whatever you want to do this morning. We'll dismiss this way, okay? I'm taking the mic off. I'm done.